Okay, so let's turn to John and uh, chapter 10, and we'll read from verse 7 through to verse 21. And this is background then for our text, which following on from this morning is John 14, and tonight we'll think specifically of verse 6. So let's turn to John's Gospel, chapter 10, and we'll read from verse 7. Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, one who is hired for the day, who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The one who's hired for the day flees because he is just that, he's hired for the day and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this flock, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice and they will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received from my father. And so it was, there was a division amongst the Jews because of what he was saying. Many of them said he has a demon and is mad. Why should we listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Okay, so keep chapter 10 there in mind. Let's turn to chapter 14. This morning we thought of the first three verses. This evening, we look at verse six. So let's read all six verses then from John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. The, and where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So verse 6 then. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's ask God to help us as we think of this together. Lord, we thank you for the day that we were able to think this morning about not allowing our hearts to continue to be troubled, but instead to focus on the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw this morning that Jesus himself had a troubled heart, and so he knows from his own experience, what it is like for us when we have a troubled heart. Help us to keep those words we heard this morning in our minds, that we have a permanent place in our Father's house, that house which is the temple, but also the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to think about the place being prepared for us and how the cross is central to that idea. And then, Jesus coming again for ourselves. Lord, we have that permanent place and we are sons and daughters in our Father's house. As we turn to this well-known verse this evening then, we ask you to bless us 
and to speak to us and to open our minds and our hearts to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin then by putting uh, chapter 14 in some sort of context. And most of you will know that it's generally understood that John's gospel uh, consists of two parts. Uh, some people would say two books are joined together uh, into one gospel. And uh, what you can see on your notice sheet for today is that some people will call the first half of John's gospel the book of signs, and then others will talk about the second half of the gospel as the book of glory. So for our purposes then, we'll think of the book of signs and the book of glory. So the first half of John's gospel starts, chapter 1, verse 19, after the prologue, and continues to the end of chapter 11. So that's the first half, or the first book. It's the book of signs. And do you remember, in that first half of John's gospel, this book of signs, we have seven signs. Now, you were all familiar with that, I'm sure, from your very early days in the Christian life. So just to reinforce the idea, turn to chapter 2. And in chapter 2 and verse 11, there is this summary then after the wedding in Cana of Galilee, when Jesus turns the water into wine, John summarizes this in verse 11 by saying, this is the beginning of signs. Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and the disciples believed in him. So there's the first of the signs and you can look in chapter 2 verse 23 there's mention there of the signs that Jesus did and so on. Now a sign is the Greek word semeion which means a pointer to a truth greater than itself. So Jesus turns the water into wine, and that act points to the person who performs the sign. And the, the truth of the person is central to that sign. So the sign tells you to look away to the person who's performed it. This person is no other than God himself, and there is that response from us of belief as you can see there in chapter 2, verse 11. So a sign shows the glory of the one who does it, and then the response of belief uh, on the part of those who see it. That's what a sign is, okay? So you have the book of signs, seven signs in the first half of John's gospel. And then as you turn to chapter 12, we have the second part of the gospel or the second book. And uh, this is for our purposes then called the book of glory. And if you take a look at chapter 12 and uh, verse uh, 28, there is the key verse for this second half of the gospel, or if you want this second book. So John 12, and verse 28, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So there's your key into this book of glory. This second half of the gospel is a demonstration of the glory of God at work in the person of Jesus Christ and all that we read about, all that happens to him, his betrayal, his arrest, his crucifixion, it's all in the context of glory, the glory of God through Jesus Christ. So the book of signs and the book of glory. Now, do you also remember that in the first book, the first half, if you prefer, of John's gospel, you have two key ideas. And those two ideas are the ideas of light and the idea of life. And I think it's about 32 times in this book of signs, you will have a reference to life. And of course, the book ends with the bringing back to life of Lazarus. 
And so if you like, in Lazarus, you have a wonderful demonstration of the life that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings Lazarus back to life at the end of the book of life okay so that first book then you have light he was the light that lights every man who comes into the world and life that's the, the two key ideas there in the second book the book of glory some of you will remember that the key word in that second book is love and you have as we saw two weeks ago having loved his own he loved them unto the end. So the second book, the book of glory, is a, a, not only a demonstration of the glory of God through the person of Jesus Christ, it is also uh, a, a demonstration of the love uh, that we see in at work in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there'll still be reference to light and love as there was re reference to love in the first book, but predominantly, that first book, the book of signs, light and life. The second book, the book of glory, has this idea of love, love being on display for us in all that we see. So there's a, a sense then of the gospel as a whole. If you turn to chapter 14, what you've got in chapter 14 and then extending into 15 and 16 and even 17 you have a wonderful picture of what it was like to be with a rabbi so jesus is the ultimate rabbi he's going to teach his disciples and what we have are a series of questions put to the rabbi by the disciples and so as you look at chapter 14 we have first of all thomas coming with a question. Then we have Philip in verse eight. And this is exactly what would have happened uh, in the day of Jesus. The disciples one by one would put a question to the rabbi and he would then answer. Go down into chapter 14 and you've got verse 22. And here is Judas, not Iscariot, asking a question. Now that's a beautiful picture of what it was like uh, between a disciple and a rabbi. Uh, the rabbi sitting at the center with his disciples gathered around, putting questions in turn, listening to his wisdom, and the rabbi would then be explaining and teaching and developing. Now that's what's going on here on this Thursday night in the upper room as Jesus is preparing uh, his disciples for his departure. And uh, the events that will unfold on this Thursday night and into the Friday is very much painted as a departure. Jesus is leaving them. And you know that he will say that where he goes, they cannot follow. And uh, that gave rise to the idea that Jesus may have been leaving the country and going into the Roman Empire. Some thought that. Others thought that he may even be considering taking his own life. And so they wouldn't be able to follow him. So there was a great deal of troubled thinking um, on the part of the disciples as they listened to their teacher, their master, as you saw in chapter 13, teaching them, telling them that he's about to leave them and uh, they must prepare for his departure. So let's come then to chapter 14. And uh, we're going to focus on verse 16, but to help us, at verse six, sorry, but to help us to do that, we need just to think about one more thing. So we've seen that there are two books or two parts to the gospel, and we've seen that there's light and life and love um, as themes uh, uh, in both books. But I want you also to notice that what we have here is a reference to the idea of relationship. Um, so look at these six verses, verse one, my father's house. And what we have is the most important relationship that this gospel provides us with. And that's the relationship between Jesus and his father. That relationship is the very heart of John's gospel. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes we try to remember books, don't we, um, by using a word. Um, and you can use the word relationship, if you wish, to remember the Gospel of John. It is a wonderful theological exploration of the relationship between Jesus and God. God is his father. He is equal with God. He is one with God. And this idea stretches right throughout the, the gospel, that Jesus is one with his father. And I just want to kind of remind you of that, if I can. So you start in the very first verse of chapter one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. The word was face to face with God. And then as you go down the prologue, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's the relationship right at the start between the word who became flesh and God. And that theme continues there. I'll just point out, if I can, one or two moments uh, just for you to be aware. Chapter five is hugely important as we think about the relationship between Jesus, the Word, and God. And let me just read you some verses. So turn to chapter 5 of this Gospel, and uh, we'll read from verse 16. And listen now to how Jesus explains his relationship with God. Chapter 5, verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus, and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. So they sought to kill him all the more, because not only had he broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now, can you see how important it is? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he has seen the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Now, these are just mind-blowing, aren't they? The son has seen the father work. Now, many of you will remember that that phrase works at the human level and the divine level. So the man, Jesus, would have seen his father, Joseph, work in the carpenter shop and he would have observed him. But in seeing Joseph, his father, work, and Jesus himself becoming a carpenter, there was a deeper truth there. And the deeper truth was Jesus, the son of God, would have seen his heavenly father work, and works in like manner as him. Verse 20, but the father loves the son, and shows him all things that he himself does. Now, again, you see, there is the human level there of Joseph loving Jesus and Joseph showing Jesus all his skills as a tradesman and uh, teaching Jesus as a young boy what it would be like to be a carpenter. So Jesus had that experience. But again, the deeper truth was that he would have seen his heavenly father who loves him also teach it uh, all that he can do. Verse 21, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. Notice life there. So you've got the idea of the relationship between the father and the son. Now that's the most important aspect of John's gospel, this relationship between Jesus and his father, how Jesus understands it, and even more wonderfully, how when he was a teenager learning from his dad, Joseph, he saw the deeper truth there of his eternal father and his relationship with him. So can you see then, this gospel is about that relationship between my father and I. Just to reinforce it a bit more, chapter 10, and uh, in chapter 10, we've got verse 30. And if there's one word that sums up the relationship between Jesus and his father, you find it in this verse. John 10 and verse 30. I and my father are one. 
Okay, so it's oneness that describes the relationship between Jesus and his father. So coming to our text, verse 14, go down into verse 7, and in response to Philip's question, you have even more on the relationship between Jesus and his father. Philip says, Lord, show us the father, and that will be enough. And Jesus says, I've been showing you the father all along. OK, so that's the central relationship in uh, John's gospel, the son and his father. Now, there are two other relationships to notice. And when I spell them out, you will see why I've been doing this. The second relationship to notice in John's gospel is that between God and the world. So you don't need me to remind you, John 3, verse 16, God loved the world, okay? And that love relationship is also found in John's gospel. And as we saw last year, it's also seen in his letters, okay? The love relationship between God and the world. And if you want one word to sum up that relationship, it's the word sent. So I and the Father are one, and then the Father loves the world, and in loving the world, he sends. Now, the third relationship that you'll see in this gospel is the relationship between Jesus and his people. And that relationship is discussed again and again and again. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. So Jesus will teach what it means to be in a relationship with him. Who he is, who we are, and what that relationship is like. So the central relationship is the father and the son. You then have the father, God, and the world. You then have Jesus and his people and what that relationship is like. I got other sheep not of this fold, okay? That's the relationship between Jesus and his people. So think of those three major relationships in John's gospel. Now, having said all that, in verse six of chapter 14, there's another relationship, one that you can easily miss in John's gospel. And verse six in chapter 14, is all about that relationship. So take a look at verse six and tell me what relationship do we have here? So I'll remind you, the son and his father, God and the world, Jesus and his people, all that the father have given to me shall come to me and not one shall be lost. Now then, what relationship is here in verse six? It's very controversial. It's very unpalatable today. This relationship is an embarrassment today. And sadly, it's an embarrassment for many who take the name Christian because the relationship in verse six is the relationship between Jesus and the world. We've had the relationship between God and the world, God loves the world, but here is the equivalent of John 3 verse 16. It is the relationship between Jesus and men and women in general. It's the relationship between Jesus and humanity. And what's that relationship? Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only route for any human being to come to God. Now, can you just appreciate how unpalatable that is? I guess we would say it's unpal unpalatable today, but has it ever been a popular truth that there is one way, only one way to God? And that one way is found only through the person 
of Jesus Christ. So if we were to make this statement in other areas, other arenas, would we get into trouble? If we were to say Jesus himself exclusively claimed to be the only way to God, how much trouble would you and I be in? Because that's what is happening in John 14, verse 6. Now, I don't want us to go uh, into discussion about why was Jesus saying this to Thomas. Um, there's a very good discussion there, but not one for us tonight. I want just to lift out verse 6 and to see it as an expression of the relationship between Jesus and humanity. And it's not the first time we see this in John's gospel. We've seen it before. And I'm sure for many of you, that verse has come to mind. No one comes to the Father, do you remember it? Except through me. That's what Jesus says. And he said it to the Jews, to the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders. And here we have it again. It's an exclusive claim. And it's a claim that is a truth claim. It is the truth that sets you free claim. And it is one that is absolute in his nature. There's no exceptions. There's no other way to God. There's no other route. There's no other truth. There is no other life. Nobody can find God in any other way. If you want one word, to sum up the relationship between Jesus and men and women is the word come. Look again, no one comes to the Father except through me. So you see it in John chapter 6 and uh, verse 44. Let's take a look at that just to reinforce the idea. Where are we? John 6 and verse 44. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. There's this idea of exclusivity. So I guess just as we think of this this evening, we need to sit for a moment and, and allow ourselves to feel the power of that statement. We live in an age of inclusivity. We live in a, an age where we can't tell somebody that what they think is right or wrong. We live in this very shifty kind of world. But sure it is, and it's got that great I am statement, John 14, verse 6, I am. Remember the, the I am that we have in the book of signs? We've read from chapter 10, I am the door. These I am statements, do you remember, echo Moses meeting with God in the desert. I am that I am. They are claims made by God himself. They are the ultimate revelation of the nature and being of God. I am. I am who I am. Well, Jesus echoes that then when he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Let's take that phrase then as we draw to a close. Let's read it, John 14 and verse six. Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, when you take that first statement, I am the way, the truth, the life, you can read it as three separate descriptions of the one who is I am. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Now you can read that in, in such a manner and that's absolutely fine. For me though, I think the way to read it is like this. I am the way which is the truth and which is the life. So truth and life describe the way. It is the way of truth, 
and it is the way that leads to life. Now, I'm not going to tell you which way you should interpret this, it's up to you, but I feel more convinced that the central idea here is way. Jesus is the way to God. He is the door that opens so that we come into the presence of God. He is the path that leads us to God. He is the one who has made available to us the, the route that takes us to God. And that way is a way of truth, and it's a way that leads to life. And I'm sure it's not um, tricky to just remind ourselves that this idea of truth and uh, and and uh, uh, life is found throughout the gospel. We've already mentioned it. So we read early from chapter 10, and just to go back to that passage, verse 7 and verse 9, with the reference to the door, seems to capture that idea of way, a path, an entrance. So John 10, verse 7, I am the door, verse 9, I am the door, okay? For many people, the door imagery uh, is the same idea as we have in our text of the way, the way in, the path towards. And then do you remember truth? John 1, uh, verse 18, is it? Uh, full of grace and truth, verse 17 maybe. Truth is what we've seen. We saw it in, in chapter 8 this morning, the truth that sets you free. And then we've had life all the way through. So to me, what Jesus is saying here to these disciples, to Thomas, but to all of them, is that they are to understand the exclusive nature of the person of Jesus. He is unique. He is only, he is the only way to God. And so when he leaves them and they are not sure where he's going and they don't know the way, what Jesus says to them is, he is the only way to God. And so he is going to make that way possible. All that's going to happen, do you remember the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, all of that is the way. It is the way to God. And he has to lay down his life so that he then is able to secure that way, make possible that way uh, to God himself. And as you'd expect, there's a building here on the Old Testament. So you've got the idea from Isaiah 40, make straight the paths of the Lord, make his way known, that you've got the idea of, of Exodus and the um, escape from Egypt, the journey to Canaan through the wilderness, the way. This whole idea then is brought together here and embodied in the person of Jesus. He is that way. He's the way out from, and he's the way into, and he has to go the way of the cross so that then we might find that way to God, that only way, and that way that leads to life. And so he will go to the cross, he will be raised to life, he will know the life of the resurrection, and echoing there, the idea that we too find life uh, as we come to him. So let's sum it up like this. You have the book of glory here, and you wouldn't think that a tale of arrest and trial and crucifixion is a demonstration of glory. It's not the demonstration of the glory of God that we would come up with left to ourselves. The arrest, the trial, and the death of Jesus is also a story of life, a journey to the um, Praetorium, to the high priest palace, uh, the journey through Jerusalem, the way to the cross is also the way that men and women come to God. The lies that occur 
at the arrest and the trial is a way by which the truth, the truth of who Jesus is and the truth of God himself is then made known. And this is something that John does again and again. Some people refer to it as the, the double meaning that John gives to things. So you're looking at something and you see it at its face value. So you see arrest, you see betrayal, you see trial, you see crucifixion, you see death, you see horror. You, you look, look at that and see it all at that level. But John is then calling you to see something far deeper, to see beyond the outward, beyond the appearance, beyond the visible, beyond the concrete, the factual, and he wants you to see what God himself is doing. And so in the person of Jesus, who is one with God, we see that relationship then between God and the world and Christ and his people being worked out a way that brings the people into the life that Jesus has come to bring. So just to round things up, you go into verse seven and you get Philip's question. You go down and you get Judas's question. Now we won't look at that. Where should we go next? We've got next Sunday. For me, one of the, the big challenges of this Thursday evening conversation between the rabbi Jesus and his disciples. One of the biggest things to grapple with and to try and make sense of is chapter 15, and especially the vine passage. Now, I don't feel ready myself to make sense of that. Where I want to go next, perhaps next Sunday morning and next Sunday evening, as we come towards Good Friday and Easter Sunday, where I want to go is John 15 and verse 9. So just as we look forward then to next Sunday, let's read John 15 and verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. What I would like us to do next Sunday is explore what we have here in John 15 and verse nine. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Now there's a very specific thing going on there. So start thinking about this now in readiness for next Sunday. What type of statement is Jesus making? Remember now rabbis, knew the art of teaching and they would use different techniques. We've seen them, haven't we, in the life of Jesus. We've seen Jesus use types of arguments in order to teach his disciples. So think about, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet your heavenly father and so on. Do you remember? Solomon in all his glory. That's the type of argument known as going from the lesser to the greater. Now, you all know that, don't you? My point here is Jesus uses certain techniques, teaching tools to reach his audience. Now, there's something like that going on here. And once you see it, the truth opens up for us, okay? So I think, I, as I see things right now, I'd like us to go there uh, on Sunday, Sunday morning. And even if we can, to then next Sunday evening, think about what it means to abide in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the word abide has a very kind of loose connection to what we thought about this morning. In my father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. Now the word abide links in to mansions. So let's think about that then for next Sunday. And then we have Good Friday. So we'll take the account in John of the crucifixion and we'll focus our thoughts down into a certain aspect of that on Good Friday. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll take 
and look at John's account of the resurrection from chapter 20. So that's the way ahead then, as I see it. Today, we've thought about dealing with our troubled hearts. And this evening, we've tried to engage with this uh, idea of the relationship between Jesus and men and women and the exclusive nature of that claim. Let's pray together. 